Um, my name is Mariana Munoz Gomez, and as Mendek said, I was the curator and writer in this project uh, with Victoria as the artist producing Sega Hole and my clan. And I'm speaking today from Winnipeg, which is in Treaty One territory. And that is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples. And it's the homeland of the Metis Nation as well. And it's where I met Victoria a couple of years ago, or maybe before that. I can't really remember. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel like I was probably familiar with your work before I met you, but I can't remember. <laughs> um, just briefly to talk about my relationship to this place. Uh, uh, my relationship to Winnipeg is uh, as an immigrant. My family settled here permanently in 2000, so I have grown up with Winnipeg as my home and visiting my family in Mexico every few years. So uh, I know that I would not be the person that I am today and I wouldn't be what I'm doing today without having the opportunity to call this place my home. So I am really grateful to be able to have lived here for over 20 years. And um, I think the typical experience of understanding Canada for a lot of immigrants um, is through lies and through a certain story that the government tells us. So we have to do some extra work to learn what Canada really is because it's not really taught in the school systems or at least not when I was growing up. So uh, one of many examples of uh, this kind of lie uh, illustrated is um, what's happening now uh, with the continued RCMP raids on Wet'suwet'en territory, unceded territory on the West Coast in BC. So just this week, there have been multiple arrests um, at gunpoints of unarmed community members, protesters to the CGL pipeline and allies. So I'll share a couple of links uh, in the chat here and then just put some links on screen for folks to check out uh, if you're able to donate to support uh, the people protecting the land over there. Um, and while I do that, I'll pass it off to you, Victoria, if you want to say some words about yourself. Uh, thank you for that and for sharing those donation links. Um, and thanks for the few people here and the people who will listen to it later on. I wanted to begin by recognizing the ongoing struggle for liberation around the world, the fight of uh, colonial powers and capitalism that is destroying our planets and communities that we live in and the ongoing fight for the end to genocide and resource extraction here in Canada, which I personally have been a part of since I was born. And I wanted to thank my ancestors for guiding me and my art and my spirit and to thank them for their fight to ensure that I have a clean air and water and land to live on and for my family to live on as well. And I really thank Mariana for helping me throughout this project and for being here today. So yeah, get into it. Thank you, Victoria. All right, let me get our screen share going here. So uh, just a couple of links that I put in the chat there. Uh, we can put them up at the end too, so folks have easy access to them. And then uh, we'll start off tonight with uh, a reading of my text that was uh, um, written accompanying uh, Victoria's collage series, Sagahole, my clan. So I'll just be flipping through the images in their series uh, as I read. So if you haven't uh, gotten a copy of C Magazine, their summer issue is themed community. And here's a little preview of how it looks in print, Victoria's image and my text at the back there. The ongoing pandemic has highlighted the way that our sense of togetherness can be interrupted, taken away, and challenged on a global scale. Yet Victoria Redson's work as an artist, poet, and land defender shows us that when we hold our relationships close, 
Expressions of community that might not be easy to see can reveal themselves in times of grief and distress. In this collage series, they engage with personal relationships and expand them into connections that stretch across space and time. Red Sun positions themselves in relation to their family and simultaneously positions their family within broader communities. The Denisuline, cross-cultural networks, non-human kin, known ancestors, ancestors who lived long before the artist was born, and a community of Indigenous artists and activists. As Red Sun began making this work while grieving deceased family members, it includes photographs from their family's archive. Images of their great aunt and uncle, grandparents, great great grandmothers, some of the relationships that give the artist strength. The series also includes depictions of Red Sun's non human kin, such as a nighthawk, strawberries, the red willow plant, caribou, the Labrador plant, the tansy plant, a gray wolf, and a blue jay, just to name a few all of whom have acted as teachers, providers, and protectors. I am reminded of Leanne Batasimusak Simpson's book, As We Have Always Done, where she writes about Anishinaabeg's spiritual connections between living beings, ancestors, ceremony, practices, and land. While her writing is based in Anishinaabeg culture and theory, Simpson also engages in cross-cultural citation with other Indigenous artists, writers, scholars, and teachers, showing how generative it can be to learn with and from each other. Working from, oh, sorry about that. Just gonna try to get this slideshow back on the road here. Working from Glenn Coltard's term, grounded normativity, a process of creating ethical frameworks that comes from place-based practices and are in continual relationships with the land. Uh, Simpson discusses Indigenous queer normativity as an embodiment of queerness therein. I was struck by how she articulates that her relationship with the spirit world, which within which Indigenous queer normativity exists, makes it possible for this normativity to be expressed in her material world. Simpson states that Indigenous queer normativity makes room for a multiplicity of relationship structures, specifying that this queerness is non-hierarchical, anti-discriminatory, and is not simply about sexual orientation or gender. In other words, the author explains that relational structures that are not valued or known within colonial heteropatriarchy are tangible through Indigenous queer normativity. Segahole Meklan enacts this, composed as it is of layers of relation, rendered with a variety of media. A mix of analog image fragments initially imagined for intimate exchange between family and friends are set in relation to crisp digital elements, reflecting on the seamless interrelation of the old with the new, the past with the living. The composition opposite, uh, the first one that we saw, uh, includes ancient pictographs from the Reindeer Lake region, which portray ancient water creators who once walked with the Denisuline. Connecting Red Sun, their family, and their knowledge to ancestors from thousands of years ago. The softly underlaid red willow plant is a medicine that one offers to their ancestors. When commemorating their great-great-grandmother, Marie de Tanikaze, pictured on the right side of the image, depicting three women among caribou. Red Sun also acknowledges the Dene people's relationship with the caribou who have kept their communities fed and healthy for thousands of years. None of these entities exist in isolation. From, uh, as Victoria says, from the ancestors to the caribou and each plant of our lands, we are all connected and have a responsibility to protect and retain our traditional knowledge. Positioned within stars in the dark sky, another collage memorializes their great aunt Sophie Marasti, an artist and activist who continues to protect her connections while in the spirit world. The impact aunties have in our community can only be shown through how we now carry our lives from their teachings, Red Sun says. In an artist statement, uh, Red Sun notes that amid a glo global pandemic, environmental destruction, colonialism, and endless warfare, we're still here. 
Their process with Segahole Bank Clan demonstrates that looking inward, engaging with an array of materials, and approaching creative expression as a modality for mourning, for reaching, can prompt an unfolding of something greater than oneself. So I have to say also, thank you so much, Victoria, for everything that you shared in the making of these images. Um, so I'll, I guess I can just mute myself and I'll scroll through if you want to talk about these images. Sure. Thank you. Wow. Hearing you say that out loud is just, it makes me feel really happy. And um, yeah, I wanted to begin um, just by acknowledging the theme of community and how I found a lot of my community strength and healing within our process of grieving. And I feel as oppressed peoples were perpetually in mourning and I feel like I've been in some really dark places and art has been the light that has brought me out of them. And through the process of creating these images, I've had many loved ones close to me pass on to the spirit world in unnatural ways that are directly related to Canada's ongoing genocide of my people. And during this process of creating this project, I've been criminalized within my grieving process and <clears throat> am now currently have pending charges uh, with Vancouver Police Department for a crime that I did not commit. So, I am definitely here because of community. And during this entire process, there was a lot of times where I didn't think I'd be able to come out of that darkness. And it was community who really brought me out of that. And that's why I chose to do a collage piece instead of words, because I felt like no words could describe the amount of injustices that we feel in our lives. So in my years of uh, exploring my identity and um, this ancient art, as such as these pictographs here, I just like felt such a huge connection to it. And there's been so many layers to it. And it's really hard to describe it in words. And the interconnectedness of everything, such as the willow in the back and like what it means to like peel the bark and to offer it and to like have the eagles come and to the wind and the fire and everything. It's just so incredibly beautiful and every element works together um, to assist in our survival as a people. And I'm really thankful for all of that. And I feel like through these images, I just wanted to show how thankful I was for everything that's been gifted to us and everything on the lands that I have the privilege of knowing their names and also the privilege of knowing where I come from as a Denisothene and Nato person from the Reindeer Lake region. It's been a long process of dismantling the internalized racism in my family that we were surrounded by because of residential schools and sanatoriums and the Catholic and the Christian churches and everything that's just been overwhelming and continues to be overwhelming. I feel like these images <laughs> kind of depict that overwhelmness as well because they're just so multi-layered and um, all collaged together. There's just like all these things that feel like are fragmented, just all men together. And I wanted to share that with this project instead of um, any other medium. And yeah, some of the images that we have is my auntie Sophie and she was such a huge influence in supporting me and being a mending force in my family it was because of her that my family came together for ceremonies came together for 
responsibly doing like a grieving ceremony for my past loved ones who are also shown here because we, our family does pass away in extremely unnatural circumstances. And it was her who understood that and organized the ceremonies for everybody. And when she passed, it felt like a huge like divide because she was so strong within that but it also showed me like not one person can take that on and it must have been so overwhelming for her to be a person that everybody goes to and I feel like that's an important part of community and here I just showed like a sun dog and um, the sun rays like around her that sun there's always <laughs> those in my community in Brochet, because of like the frosty air, it just like creates such beautiful sunsets and sunrises. And it's such a beautiful thing. Even when it's minus 40 outside, you can still see these remarkable things of the land and all of the yarrow around her. It's like a healing feminine plant and the universe behind her as well is just where I feel like she belongs. and where we all belong in our family because I feel like she really understood the interconnectedness of the universe and the mountains that are shown is where she lived in North Vancouver and where I visited her most of the time. And I saw her place and community like on downtown East Side. She knew everybody's name. She was always like so happy to see everybody. And she was such a huge important part of the community in Vancouver and she was like probably the only person who was out there and I feel like she was out there because she wanted to feel justice for her sister who was murdered also in the downtown east side uh, who I never got to meet and her name was Rose Morastity and um, so there was so many things within creating this image and like I showed my aunties and like her sisters and they were crying and they loved it and they felt like it was a honor to her because I feel like when these huge famous people pass away, there's huge celebrations and they get honored for centuries. And when our people die and get murdered, there's nothing, there's not even a t-shirt, <laughs> which isn't, you know, an important part of honoring somebody, but like our ways have been completely dismantled um, by colonial forces. And I feel like I the baby picture beside me, I found it so hilarious. I was going through my auntie's pictures um, when I was at her place in Prince Albert in Saskatchewan. After I got arrested, I like came all the way back to Winnipeg and I stopped in Saskatchewan and I photocopied all of these pictures on my scanner and I just loved all of them. And I was just, and the red sun, um, my grandparents took it when they're out on the land. And I just found it so incredibly beautiful because our people's name were also called like Seizi Dene, which means sun under people. And I just think my name, like Sa Goze Red Sun is just such an a beautiful part of that interconnectedness of the land. And that name was given to me in ceremony. And it's just everything just feels so like connected and like all comes together. It feels like a beautiful story. And these two eagles that are in these pictures, they're both painted by um, my uncle Agnes Morassidy, who was also murdered. Um, but in Thompson, but he was an incredible muralist and oil painter. And he's really what uh, brought me into painting from a young age. And yeah, just really powerful that I'm able to see these images from my family, um, especially such incredible pieces of work that um, I've been gifted, it feels like. And uh, I have a police car burning in the back and I added my face tattoos on a little baby picture because I just feel like they've always been on me. And I think that I've earned a lot of them. And I think throughout my lifetime, they're reminders of who I am and everything that I've done and everything that I've yet to do um, because they're commitment and they're uh, act of ceremony and 
yeah, I'm just happy that I can share these in such an intimate way. And <clears throat> not sure what's on the next slide. I think it's my uncle. Um, that's my uncle Gabriel Morasti, and he was a black belt in Taekwondo. And <laughs> as you can see in that image, I just found that hilarious because it's just like this Denny man from the north of Manitoba, and he's just like extremely well skilled in martial arts um, in like the 80s and 90s. <laughs> and I edited that whole image like before that I, I talked to my family and I read his obituary and it had his like spirit name in there and it was gray cloud man like gray cloud like wolf man and I was like oh my gosh <laughs> and because that's the exact image in that photo and his sister my grandmother uh, took that photo and the wolf pictured in the back is by a local Manitoban artist who I can't remember his name but that's like the largest wolf mural um, it's the largest like lighted mural in Canada or something, but it's in Thompson and I grew up right beside that mural and it's enormous. And um, yeah, I just thought he was, he was also like a painter and an artist and he was a father <clears throat> and he was, um, he passed away in also sad circumstances. But um, in the back there is like one of the fishing camps that my family would always go to and there's cranberries and blueberries because I feel like our family, like the men in our family, throw all of the things that they've been forced into like gang violence and police violence and <clears throat> all the things that indigenous men <clears throat> are usually put into, like most of our prison system is, indigenous men so I feel like the land and our foods and our spirit and our art is truly what grounds our people and what creates like amazing fathers like him so I'm thankful that he had the opportunity to be connected to our land and to be connected to a spiritual thing like <laughs> martial arts and beside this is um they all have like a similar aspect of like these old photos that I photocopied from my auntie Eileen, who is still around. And um, my grandfather, he was an Irishman and he kind of quit the whole Irish thing and ran away up north with my grandmother and just lived this like incredibly rich life on the land with hunting caribou and fishing and pretty much just like endless sky and land and water to raise my mother and my uncles on. And I have a lot of admiration for him, um, even though he was Irish and <clears throat> he was white and people didn't like him from my community because he was white. Um, and I feel like he was a part of the community and he was eventually accepted for who he was. And he really provided for everybody in his life and taught all of my uncles who would have been and who have been like brought into the prison systems and everything. But he taught them all carpentry and he taught them all everything they need to know to live on the land and every corner of our territory he explored and showed my family so that they could continue it on which my cousins now continued on and myself so i plan on living on my territory and ex exploring these places that my family have always known because i don't have the privilege of um being in the 16th century and living freely on my lands um without intervention but i feel like I've garnered enough strength to do that. And um, the Blue Jay always comes to me. Whenever I think about him, I see it outside. And I think of the relationship that the Blue Jay has to all the other animals. And I just think it's so powerful, um, the way that the animal world connects with each other and supports each other and helps each other, even though they're all very different. 
And the next images are of my grandmothers. And in the, the one with the three women, the one on the far right is my great grandmother. My great, great, great grandmother. I mean, Dinakaze, Ditanakaze. And in the right image is my grandmother who I grew up with and her name is Dorothy Morasti. And they're all from Broche, Manitoba, and we're also founders of the village of Lac Broche, which is a Dene community. And it's also a dry community because uh, Broche um, was becoming kind of a post for trading. And that means a lot of settlers were coming in, which means a lot of drugs and alcohol were also coming in. So I find that interesting how we just like pick up <laughs> and move. And I feel like that's something Dene people have always done because I have relatives in New Mexico that I've never met, but I've, <laughs> I just have no clue on how they got there, but they must've been there for so long, but they just like picked up as a family, as a community and just moved. And there's so many, different stories of why those migrations happen. And I've just been learning all of them to try to puzzle piece it all together. And I feel like as Dene people, we're really reliant on each other and we're reliant on the caribou and of the bison as well. And of each of the plants that are pictured here and behind my grandmother, Dorothy, is the sand dunes of uh, Athabasca. And it's the most northern sand dunes in the world, I'm pretty sure. And I just find that interesting how Dene people live <laughs> in these very sandy environments in the north and also in the deserts in the south um, that you wouldn't typically find. Also, they live in um, where the flooding is happening right now on Inthakatan territory. There is a portion of Inthakatan slash Dene people <laughs> on their land, like in the desert, because Dene people just went everywhere. And we were given these different plots of land um, on other people's territories. So from my travels and from being with community, I've learned these things. And I've just been like guided to these places and um, exploring these different regions where my people have been welcomed without any prior knowing. Yeah, and I'm not sure how time is right now. I'm not sure. I think we're, I think just... we're at we're five uh five oh four Winnipeg time, so we have a few minutes before we get uh, into audience questions. Yeah, did you have any comments? Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for going into the images. Um, one of my questions was going to be about like reflections on things you've learned from these communities that you've grown relationships with. Um, and I feel like that's what you've been talking about the whole time while you've been looking at these images. Um, but yeah, if you if you have anything else to add to that, if not, I feel like you already answered that question. Yeah, I think like going back home on the reserve and like I'm not from the reserve I like went to the reserve every few months and visited and like everything like that but there's so much really bad stuff going on in reserves people don't really talk about it um even to this day but there's a lot of things that happen in those communities that are directly related to like residential schools and everything like that but it's like everybody who I meet they're like who's your mom who's your grandma who's your grandpa da, 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 da. who's your dad and like I just I tell them who I am and they're like oh okay and they like just know me and I feel like such a strong kinship with people and pe like cousins who I've met like later in life I've like had these like really powerful dreams of me and them that are like spiritually just like beautiful and dreaming of us on the land and dreaming of us like painting and like pictographs and things like that. So I think like all of my ancestors who have passed, they've just like introduced me to all these really cool people and like have guided me in these ways and have taught me some things um, as well. And I think living in Winnipeg, like it's such a powerful place um, 
being like a center point of Churchill Island, it's like an energy point there from what I've observed. And it was a little too much for me seeing everybody on the street who like, I'm probably related to, they probably know my family. They probably have the same last name as me um, or like my grandmother's last names or my great grandfather's last names. And it's really hard to be so close to a community where um, it's super draining to, to all um, be criminalized and to work in land defense and to also be a poet and poets are very sensitive people. So it's like all this emotion is spilling out of me and there's just not enough um, energy to write it all out, um, especially at my young age. So. That's some of the things <laughs> that I've learned. Yeah, I'm, uh, I was uh, interested in how you would kind of approach uh, this image making just because I was familiar with some of your poetry and you've made some videos uh, that highlight your poetry as well. So it was uh, really cool to, to see like more images from you, I guess, in this process. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I did one collage project in my grade 12 of high school. And I had like a Métis teacher, she's really cool. And she introduced me to a ton of different artists um, during like the Standing Rock time. And um, yeah, so I did like a collage project and she was like, you need to do more of this. And I ha it's like a magazine that I made and it's like very political and graphic and some things but I just like cut it out from old magazines and like drew my own things and I worked really hard on it it's probably like 15 different pieces um but yeah that's I always wanted to explore that more visual arts because I do draw a lot and I paint a lot so I would I was like really looking forward to kind of exploring this medium even though um poetry and writing was a little bit more expected from me <laughs> but during the time I just it was really hard to think about writing <laughs> yeah for sure no and I think um yeah you've shown like how how many stories can come through in an image as well so it's not just the the written word that can uh communicate that yeah yeah thanks for allowing the space for me to keep to explore the creative practice. For sure. Yeah, I think we're almost at our audience question time, but I uh, just want to say I'm really excited to see what you continue making. Um, we we kind of ran out of time to talk about it, but you're working on a film right now. So uh, maybe we'll have some time if there aren't a lot of questions, if you want to talk about that. But um, uh, Mandek, did you want to? Say yes. anything at this point. Okay, so as we transition to our exciting portion, I do want to encourage those of you in the audience to pop any questions that you want to have. Get us started. I, I do have a question for you, Victoria. So that image of that burning police car layered underneath your baby portrait is, is so striking to me when you think of life and its that of violence, especially when you think of the violence of the RCMP and the coastal gas savior. So I would love to hear you um, speak more about why you juxtapose those two images together, the car on fire, which is looking instantly at abolition and severity. Yeah. Yeah, I did find it funny a little bit putting my baby picture in there because that's how I feel in these spaces. I just feel like a child, but I'm not seen as a child. I'm seen as like a violent person who is like capable of great destruction and like who is unstable and like all these things that police and government view us as because we're specifically targeted as Indigenous youth um during these actions and 
that is just no question about it. Like a group of indigenous youth will just like stand together talking amongst each other and will be like surveilled and recorded and like photographed and da 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 da. Even our basketball games where children play basketball, like all native basketball terminants, like RCMP and CSIS sent surveillance undercover agents to those basketball games. And that can be read in policing indigenous descent, um, which is by a publication company in Winnipeg, but from living in Winnipeg, there is different organizations like Bar Nun, um, and also my own family history of incarceration. Like, oh my goodness, it's just like so directly targeted against our people. And even Stony Mountain in Winnipeg, like that's where all those warriors, like Poundmaker, were imprisoned. Um, so it's just a lot of history of criminalization and. I think burning police cars is like funny, but like the true reality of it is like those things happen a lot in the United States and it just like causes a lot of violence on our bodies, which is not our fault. We're not the ones starting that violence. Um, but I do think that it's just like our inner child that really needs that freedom. And I think that we need to be guided by that um, in any way <laughs> uh, necessary. But I'm definitely calmed down um, from my pending charges, which is I made that image right after I got arrested and released, which was in like a few hours because my community was outside of the police station doing court support and I heard the officers say that the only reason that they were releasing me is because of everybody who is outside supporting my release. So I truly just would not be here <laughs> if it wasn't for my community and during that time I just like felt like such a baby because once you're behind bars, <laughs> once you're handcuffed, once there's everything on you once you're in the police station once you're underground in the car da, 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 there's no way out and that feeling of helplessness is like it reaches down to your very core um so I just wanted to show that that during that time even though I felt like I was lucky that I got out because I looked outside and like as the garage was going down I was like well, that's the last time I'm gonna see the free world. But I I just wanted to be free. And I think since then I've really been focusing on my own uh, growth um, as an artist because I feel like that's the way that I can continue resisting without being behind bars. Um, so yeah and I feel like since I was a child I've been drawing and painting and taking pictures and everything so I've been trying to get back to that um instead of just dedicating my whole life to living in this very oppressed and like fighting way which I feel like isn't indigenous two-spirit responsibility it should be you know everybody's responsibility um yeah thank you for that I really like that image I want to do a self-portrait as well because yeah thank you so much oh, you. for that answer yeah and that context is super helpful that baby portrait it's like seeing from outside of a separate gaze that can be as a, a threat right because even your inclusion of those pictographs are like a very dangerous reminder to the government that there are always going to be otherwise um, knowledge is otherwise ways of being to colonialism. And that is that is such a threat, and that's why you know even right now you see the RCMP in, in the context of you know where I am in like southern Ontario, you have like the CSIS calling 1492 land back lane like a, a threat to the Canadian state in their own internal memos. So. Um, to see, um, I think these images do really speak to this sort of reminder that uh, 
um, for as long as colonialism will persist, so you know, different forms of social organization and different forms of resistance. And like, yeah, we covered thousands of years in this really beautiful genealogy. So thank you. Thanks. That's really good to hear that you got that. I was hoping people get it, which I think a lot of people really understand that. So I just want to be a part of that. Just want to remind folks in the audience as well that you're welcome to add any questions or comments you'd like to, to share in the chat um, as well. Um, I know. Um, I don't know if you also had a, a question, Mariana. I'm, I'm mindful that I don't want to take up too much space in, in the Q and A, but I also have questions as well to, that I'm happy to share. Sure. Yeah, and also Victoria, I think if you have questions like for for me during this process, um, you want to talk about now, like feel free. Um, maybe I'll give you a chance if you want to say something. If not, I have a question to ask you. Yeah, I just want, like, all the words that you use is, like, it flows so profoundly, and I just wanted to know, like, where you draw that from, like, your writing from, because it's, like, not academic writing, but it is, like, so well thought out, and I just wanted to know, like, how you got there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I feel like... Um... My writing practice, I feel like I've written maybe like two or three poems, um, but it's kind of a similar way as I would write anything else um, where I just kind of like have to put my thoughts down on paper. And obviously with something like poetry, um, it's less like there's a task at hand. Like with this project, there was a task at hand and I think what really inspired me for writing this piece to go with your images um, was really that connection that I saw between like your process and uh, your creative process, especially with this work and what I was learning from Leanne Simpson's book, uh, as we have always done. Um, like one thing that uh, really struck me was how both Leanne and you were talking about learning, like actively learning and having an active relationship uh, with these ancestors, even if they have passed on. And I just thought that was really beautiful and like really comforting. Um, I'm sure for a lot of people that have been going through everything that's been happening, pandemic or not. Um, so that was kind of one one inspiration, I guess, uh, while I was writing the text. But yeah, thank you so much for um, those kind words. I really don't know what to say otherwise about like piecing piecing the words together for the text. Uh, yeah, I'm just really inspired by what you were making. Thank you. Yeah, you you use so many good words, like so many good descriptive <laughs> words. And as a poet, I have so much struggle finding like original words to use in the English language, but you somehow did it, so. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I'm always like synonym of like a really common word. <laughs> yeah, I try to do that and I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't fit. And then like <laughs> my whole piece is like dull and then there's like in this interesting word. Like when I try to do descriptive work instead of like creative writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> I've been doing a little bit more writing. Um, I've been trying to do that indigenous art writing award. I've been getting a little bit more motivation to kind of search for work. Um, I think Toronto is really everybody hustling around me. It's kind of getting to me. So yeah, um, when I was living up in my territory, I was doing lots of like creative film work, but I didn't have like a good computer to edit on. So I just have all this raw footage of um, my land and I've been waiting to edit it. and. Um, just kind of developing my own style of filmmaking uh, during this process has been um, a little bit difficult, but I think that I'll be getting a lot more guidance in the next few months 
um, from different people and filmmakers. So yeah, that's my film um, was also like connected to this process because my film development has been a lot about reading archeological texts of like ancient hunting practices of the Dene, which is so interesting. There's like costumes involved and there's um, lots of like flags and stuff to like get um, and like ceremonies and dreams. And there's all these incredible things that relate to our hunting practices. And it involves everybody in the community. It's not just the men, like how it is today, how the men go out on their skidoos and da 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 before when we didn't have as much resources, it included everybody, including the children. So I've been really trying to um, figure out how I'm gonna show that on film, but I am excited to go on a caribou hunt, um, hopefully next winter. Um, I don't think I'll get there this winter, um, but I think that's okay because it's pretty cold up there right now. And part of the development process is also just figuring out how I'm gonna film in like minus 50 weather in the Arctic. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I've been working on right now. And um, just trying to work more in the film industry to kind of gain more connections within uh, production, which um, has been pretty successful so far. So that's why I'm kind of here in Toronto. And um, yeah, just writing a lot as well. And um, hopefully gonna be finding more publications to release my writing in. Uh, mm. yeah. yeah, I'm so excited to see the film. And uh, when you were talking about writing uh, just now, it reminded me, I think you, you said that sometimes you have uh, trouble finding the word or like finding an eloquent word in English. And I remembered I did watch your performances that you mentioned that you did for Pride Winnipeg this past September. Um, and I think you used some non-English words uh, in some yeah. form there, right? Yeah, which I thought is, I always think that's awesome. Like, I love that. I love hearing the language. I love not knowing what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really flows. And writing poetry in the language is a lot easier because it's like, I'm not fully fluent, but it's like nice to have like these fragmented pieces of the language like mended together and then like trying to make the grammar correct and everything. It's a nice new part of the writing process for me, uh, just like trying to connect more to the language, which is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess if folks want to get to know your poetry practice a little more, um, I've just found stuff on YouTube. Is that the best place that they can find it? Yeah, probably just like Googling Victoria Radson would show a lot of results for my work. And um, hopefully I'll have a website soon to mm -hmm. kind of archive all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So I, I, I have another one prepared for you. Um, I just remember something you said, Victoria, throughout um, your talk, where you're attending to your family that has passed on through very like, unnatural methods. Um, and, you know, what does it mean to sort of like, attend to that, like, to the vet, especially when so much of it is caused by settler state violence and you know, what becomes possible when you sit with the lessons of, that you told us of your aunt's stories or your great grandmother. Um, I'm very grateful for you to have shared that with us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it definitely is a pretty heavy topic and like the word, I've been using the word kind of unnatural death because um, I think that there's a lot of natural ways people die. Like every old white person I know dies from a natural death, you know, like they die of old age. Um, you know, they die peacefully in their sleep. But then our people are like brutalized until like their last breath. So it's just 
such a huge contradiction. It's like, well, all death is unnatural. It's like, no, death is a very natural part of the human life. And it's a beautiful part of life. And that's why our teachings share about it. And since I was a young person, like it's always been spoken of in a respectful way and in a way that is interconnected and in ceremonies that I've been brought up in as well. It's also been something that hasn't been taboo, but it's just been greatly respected because it's such a powerful moment in the human life of transitioning. So yeah, definitely very tough and a thing that really brings down a lot of our movements um, because if we weren't all dying, I feel like we'd be able to like rise up to everything that is happening in the world, such as the world melting. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I see we have one more question in the chat. Um, I guess we could briefly attend to that, but thank you also for coming for sharing that because those images also made me think of yeah, my own family history so very unnatural that at the hands of the state so it's, it's quite impactful so yeah it's worldwide Dylan is asking I guess I guess related to that sort of Im imagery um, they say I really appreciate the layering and connection between each element as well as the different forms of artistic expression I'm curious, how would you translate this layering and different modes of expression as well as non-linear storytelling in a video format? So don't, I'm afraid we're a bit tight for time, but if y'all could yeah. very briefly speak to that for Dylan. Yeah, um, I think like the biggest part of creating film is like sound. And I've been, I commissioned Casey Khoisan to create audio for me for one of my short films and it just like created such an immense amount of like layering within the images and I think like the timing of it and then like the repeating and then like the the flickering between video and image and the different colors and contrast and all the things that you can play with in video is it just allows so much more expression to what you're watching and that none of that has to include speaking as well which I I've been really inspired by that by like great filmmakers like Natalie Kubrick and these big like space shows where like silence is so important and yeah I think silence and sound really give a great amount of depth to art. Thank you for that question, Dylan. Yeah, thank you, Dylan, and, and thank you, everyone. And I believe that that's all the time that we have for today. So, yeah, deep gratitude to you both, Mariana and Victoria, and to all your all the attendees for joining us. Just a reminder in the chat, we do have a symposium going on until December 15th, so if you'd like to register for the events, those are there. And I'm also going to place the chat to donate to the Silicon. Again, these are various links for you all to click on. Thank you very, thank you very much, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Smendak. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.